Welcome to the Affiliate Guy Podcast. If you want to grow your income, serve your tribe, and enjoy all the benefits of affiliate marketing and having your own affiliates, you're in the right place. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. So I got to share this interesting conversation I just had. Um, I'm, uh, I'm at Michael Hyatt's affiliate retreat, and um, we're, we're sitting around the, the table, and it's uh, it's me and Michael and Jeff Walker and uh, our spouses and Michael's team, uh, well, you know, some of Michael's team. And this, the, the topic, some, I don't know how we even got there. I can't remember how we got there. But we were talking about uh, a fear-based marketing and the, the ethics of that. Is it acceptable to use fear in your marketing? And, you know, the short version is we all agree that, that it is. And that there are times when uh, there are times when it's acceptable and times when I think we would agree that it's not. And certainly anything where you are being, um, if, if you feel unethical, it probably is. But there's sometimes when you might feel unethical that it's, it's actually not. And you know, certainly anytime where it's false, you're selling people a false fear. You know, I think one of the examples that came up, if you're telling people that if you don't use antibacterial soap, that you know you're more likely to, you know, to get um, multiple sclerosis. That that's not true. If you tell people that was, I think the other one was like, you know, if you tell people that hand sanitizer will keep you from getting AIDS, that's that's not true. That's a fear based thing. Uh, that's it's, it's uh, false. You know, fear based marketing. But you know, the reality is, and this is it's something I read in the book Biology. And when I say biology, I mean B U. I have to picture this B U Y O L O G Y. <laughs> and you know, he talks about I forget the author's name, but he talks about how you know fear can be an extremely persuasive marketing technique. And there's actually uh, biological reasons for that. You know, when we're stressed, when we're afraid, we we look for these things that are uh, that are comforting. We look for we look for pleasant experiences. We look for, um, uh, I think the term he used was solid foundations. And it reminds me, you know, after 9-11, the, the increase, like the, uh, there was a dramatic increase in the sales of peanut butter and jelly after 9-11. And in fact, the number one requested meal, the number one requested food for the, for the workers there, you know, the, the FBI, the, the, you know, NYPD, FDNY, all of the you know EMT workers, uh, just all of those people. The the number one requested food was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Why? Because they take us back to a time when things were simpler, and they they bring us comfort. And, and without getting into the health of it, because you know I'm I'm really trying. I've shared this openly. You know I'm trying to get healthier, and I'm trying to um, not eat stuff like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But you have to admit that there's something about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I mean, oh my goodness. It, 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 it tastes better than just the peanut butter and the jelly and the bread. Yeah, that, that's a part of it. But it's part of it is because it takes, it back, takes you back to a, a place when you were safe, a time when you were safe, a time when you didn't have stress and worry. And so we seek those things. Well, sometimes we seek those things in the form of purchases. And what, what happens, and this is true with the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and it's true when you purchase a product, as Ridgely Goldsboro, my friend Ridgely says, people buy because the act of buying makes them feel good about themselves. We get this rush of dopamine. So when we eat the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they're, they're actually, you, you're getting a dopamine hit. And it, if you look at the immediate results of that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, it can reduce your, your stress levels. Now, long term, it might not be healthy for you. That's why they call it comfort food. That's that's why it's called comfort food. It reduces your stress levels. And so that dopamine that we get when we eat the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, it, when it releases, it, it causes us to want to eat more. Well, the same is true when you when somebody buys something, it causes them to want more. And we can use that to our advantage, not in an unethical way, but in a way that says we're helping you solve a problem. You know, and so 
how does fear-based marketing work in, in that sense? Well, you know, I always think of, uh, we, we talked about this, and the other guys at the table are considerably older than me. I am by far, my wife is the youngest person at the table, and I'm the second youngest person at the table, you know? And so the, so they were blown away, but I, you know, I'm a, I'm a political junkie. I, I grew up working in politics and, and so I studied a lot of the ads and I remember it was, uh, Lyndon, uh, um, LBJ's Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson in the 1964 presidential election. He was running against Barry Goldwater and he ran this commercial. It's called the Daisy commercial. And it's this iconic, you know, look it up like LBJ Daisy on YouTube and you'll see it. it's just a 30 second commercial and this, this girl's playing with daisies and there's, you know, uh, I think she's, I, I don't remember exactly, but she's like, la, 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 you know, and she's blowing on it and she's just having this amazing time, right? Innocence, safety, um, childlike, you know, these are words that come to mind, our future, our security, and then <clears throat> this big nuclear explosion behind her. And then it says something like, you know, I forget the, the iconic, it's got this great voiceover and it says something like, you know, our future is on the line. I don't remember exactly what it says. Vote Johnson on November 4th. I mean, literally he's saying you either vote for LBJ or you're going to perish in nuclear war. <laughs> I mean, those are the two like choices, right? Do you want to perish in nuclear war? I don't think so. Maybe not not today. Maybe next week, you know? I mean, it's like, that's, it's crazy. And so I, um, in, in this book, uh, biology, he, uh, he talks about this study from, oh my gosh, what was the guy's name? I used to study, uh, Tom Friedman. He was a political strategist. And, um, and I, cause I remember this study, you know, but I remember in the book biology, he talks about this. And I remember studying this and it was like, uh, they, they examined the, the voters amygdalas and, uh, which the, the amygdala, you know, is part of a part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that controls fear. And, um, and so he, he watched as they, as they, as they viewed the commercial and they studied this and there were the, the amygdala is going like lighting up when they do the brain scans, like it's, it's red, you know, it's like dark red and you know, it's like flashing, you know, and it's just, the amygdala is going crazy. Well, it's no surprise, LBJ. I mean, LBJ won in a landslide. I think it was like the fourth biggest margin of victory in a presidential election. You know, Reagan over Mondale was the biggest, I believe. And <laughs> it's no surprise that he won in a landslide, in part because that ad in and of itself is not the only reason, but that ad represented his entire message, which is if you elect Goldwater, you're going to die in nuclear war. I'm not going to get into the merits of that, <laughs> you know, uh, but the point there was it was very effective marketing. It was very effective marketing. And so we talked about this, like, what is what are the ethics of something like that in marketing? Well, again, it's ethical when you use fear, when you use existing fears, these were fears that already existed in the 1960s. Nuclear, nuclear holocaust was on the forefront of everyone's mind. If you go back and stand, it's hard to believe that's like 50, was it 55 years ago? Oh my gosh, it's hard to believe that that's so long ago. For, for some people, it's hard to believe that's so long ago. But you know, most of the, not most, a good chunk of the people at that table were born before 1964. A few of them remember seeing that, like in the back of their minds, remember seeing that television ad like live, you know, on TV, on one of the two stations they had back then, you know. And so it was, it was in the forefront of people's minds. Now, you could argue that Johnson was unethical by saying, well, no, that's, that, you know, if you elect Goldar, that doesn't mean there's, uh, you know, that you're going to die in a nuclear war. But what he is suggesting and what, you know, you could argue that they felt wholeheartedly was that electing Goldwater would increase our chances of ending up in nuclear war. And I, I don't agree with that. But I do believe that if they truly felt that, it was an ethical argument. It was an ethical argument. And so it's no different than if you have a, a candidate who maybe, you know, as a, as a senator, as a congressman, you know, 
uh, did something that people disagree with. I, I can't think of an example right now. You know, but okay, they voted for, you know, they voted to like eliminate taxes on oil companies or something. And if you come out and then say as a candidate, if, if you elect him, he's going to do the same thing. And that's going to lead to these consequences. It's not unethical. It's not unethical in my opinion. And so the same is true in marketing. If you have uh, potential customers who are fearful of certain outcomes. Now, I'm not saying that if you, you go out there and you say, if you don't start an internet-based business, your family's all going to die. You know, if you don't start it, if we don't have more entrepreneurs, the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. Like that's not the case. If you don't buy this hand sanitizer, you're probably going to get scoliosis. If you don't know what scoliosis is, Google it because there would be no connection clearly. <laughs> you know, like those are unethical things, but you can use these to your advantage and as a way to serve your audience. And some of the examples I always think of, if you've got an audience of smokers, you have an audience of smokers and you tell them, listen, you're going to miss your grandchildren's best years. That is true. And if that puts the fear of God in them, and if that makes them start sobbing uncontrollably, okay, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that, isn't that a good thing to lead them to that place? Not just to buy your product, but to solve their problem. What if you say, um, you know, you have an, you have an audience uh, that's addicted to pornography and you say, it will destroy your marriage. You will end up single and alone if you don't overcome this addiction. How, how is that a bad thing? How is it? Cause that's true for so many people. And that's one of the examples that we talked about. Um, you know, fear-based marketing, uh, it can be effective and it can be done ethically. And so I, I encourage you uh, just a, a couple of tips that we kind of can't, you know, as we talked about this, number one, tap into existing fears. Don't create a new fear. Do not go out and, and you know, and cre create something that's not real, which leads me to number two. Again, number two, uh, be honest, be honest with those fears, you know, be honest with the connection between the fear and the result. And number three, allow the, the person, the potential buyer to come to their own conclusions and use things. What I mean by that is, you know, Johnson didn't explicitly say you're going to die in a nuclear war. If you elect this guy, he didn't say that. He allowed the voter to come to their own conclusions. It was implied, but he still allowed them to come to their own conclusions. And so allow them to come to their own conclusions and use things. So this is where you use the fear and then the positive. You use the success stories. You use your testimonials. You use your authority. So you say something like, you know, if you keep smoking, you're never going to see your grandchildren. Okay, that's the first part. Not the greatest message, but you get the idea, right? And then you turn around and you talk about how I, I smoked for 14 years before I did this. And then you share Susie's story of, you know, she was diagnosed with emphysema. And so she had to quit and she did with your program. And now 12 years later, she's smoke free and her lungs have cleared up and she's 80% of the emphysema is gone. And then you share it with so-and-so and you share so-and-so's story and so-and-so's story. And you do this when you're promoting affiliate products as well. You know, you can, you can use that fear, but then you turn around and find a positive. You share the positive side, the testimonial, the, the, the case study, your own story, whatever it may be. That's how you can use this in an ethical way and an effective way. So, uh, really cool conversation. Uh, today just uh, didn't see that coming. Wanted to record this while it was fresh on my mind. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up. I'm going to get back to enjoying my time here, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening today. Remember to check out all of our deep dives into affiliate marketing at theaffiliateguy.tv. And if you have a question, you can ask it at asktheaffiliateguy.com. Who knows, might end up being featured on this podcast.